Welcome to this August edition of Local Image. We're on the property of a local resident in the city of Grant. Grant was settled by farmers from the east coast of the U.S. in the 1850s. It began as a township and became a city in 1996. Grant is known for its large lot sizes and abundant natural habitat that attracts hobby farmers, horse breeders, and those who board horses, like the owner of this property called Gateway Stables. The owner, Lauren Cedarstrom, shared his passion for this community, his involvement in it, and life on the farm in this local image story. Here he comes. So what do you got there, Lauren? This is senior feed. Uh, horses' teeth only last about 25 years, and this guy is 33. We have to feed him specially, and as you can see, this guy is pretty healthy. Uh -huh. He's still very enthusiastic. He's not lazy. You take him on the trail, and he wants to go. And Arabs are famous for that. They use them for some endurance horses. So you've been in Grant now for how many years? 92. Since I came 1992. out. Since 1992. And obviously, I assume you like this because the soil is really good here. And you got a huge piece of property. How well, many? 43 acres 43 I have. Acres? I bought two 20 acre plus pieces of property. They used to be hobby farming. Now they call it small acreage farmers. Okay. Farming. And so for me, being out here in the fresh air, listening, to the birds. I mean, there's a lake over here in the morning when I go out. Sometimes I hear a loon flying overhead. Yesterday there was an eagle that was within a hundred feet of the peak of my house that flew over. And it's just wonderful to be out here with nature, fresh air. Hearing those whinny sounds. Oh yeah, they're, they're, they're begging for food, which I will give them shortly. And you know, the other thing is at night it's so quiet. Yeah. There's no noise. You hear a car go by and you almost want to get up and look. Who's that? <laughs> Man, I, I mean, you're just oozing with passion for yeah. what you do here and your lifestyle. You love it. Oh, absolutely. And instead of going to the cabin, I walk out my door and I'm here. Yeah, yeah. And, and these can... horses are beautiful. I mean, tell us quickly what types of horses you have. We have some Appaloosas. <clears throat> we have some Arabs. The, the old guy's an Arab. Then we have quarter horses and then we have mixes. A uh, couple of my boarders have thoroughbreds. We have four... Uh, uh, Morgan horses, and that was used by the cavalry because they can get by in very little. You notice how fat they were. <laughs> they're, they're very easy keepers. I, I care very much about my horses, even the way we introduce them. We just don't throw them in the herd. We introduce a few at a time. So from that standpoint, uh, it's a kind of, I'm trying to run a kinder, gentler thing. It gives me a reason to get up in the morning, you know. Uh, and it's for me it's very invigorating you yeah, know I yeah. also can add to my tractor collection I have a few how old many tractors do you have well old ones or new ones I, <laughs> I have about five old ones that I, I have a 60 John Deere 1954 I have an 8N Ford from 52 I have a Farmall M that's res totally restored I have that Moline over there that's 60 I have a 73 Oliver and those are my play tractors I also have a couple little ones that like lawn tractors but my new stuff is, is the John Deere's that I literally farm with because when you're doing hay, you have a window of opportunity and you can't have a breakdown. Right. And you have to have parts available now if they do break down. Well, Lauren, um, what else about Grant do you love? Because you're really active in this community, aren't well, you? Well, yes, I am. I belong to the GRP. I'm a... Uh, What's on the, the GRP? Gr Grant Restoration Project. It's okay. a group of individuals that wanted to bring the community together. You see, Grant is unique because it's it has no downtown and there's only two restaurants. Normal, Normally in small rural areas, the restaurants and high schools are the congregating social areas. Right. Well, Grant, half the students go to Montemidi, the other half go to Stillwater. Well, that takes care of that social aspect. Well, we only have two restaurants. So we really have no central place to, to visit. Sure. So we started the GRP. We have a cleanup in the spring. We have a large tractor parade, and I think Channel yes. 19's covered that. Yep. And we started, this is the third year we started from nothing, and now we're up to like about, we're up to about 80 or 90 parade units, and we end up feeding 600 people. We go through there and have a, have a picnic afterwards. Uh, and so we're trying to bring the people together. Yeah. I'm also on the planning commission, and I'm also a cable commissioner. And uh, the interesting thing is I kind of backed into my own show. I have the All Around Grant show, trying to feature things. One of the things, I had worked in a high school for 29 years, and the only publicity young people get is if they're the football star or if they rob a liquor store and steal a car or both. So my show, I featured... Uh, 
uh, several 4-H groups, some Boy Scouts. I featured the Civil Air Patrol, which is the, the Civil Air Patrol is to airplanes what Boy Scouts is to camping. Okay. And I've also featured some like Costas, the greenhouse. I featured Axe Dolls. I featured Amots, the apple farm. And we're trying to to just kind of show what Grant right. is, what all around Grant is, and also all the positive things. And also, you know, kind of have a venue to recognize young people when they're doing something positive, because they're our future. They're, you know, any activities that develop like 4-H that develops citizenship and social right. responsibility, I think is very, very you, important. Where does this come from, this this care that you have for, for our youth here? Where do you think that comes from? It's really fun to help these kids yeah. succeed. You know, they, they just need a little bit of direction. A lot of them have some good common sense. They have a desire to work. They, mm -hmm. And a lot of what I did was career exploration and uh, help the kids get on their way. I've, yeah, I've received letters after the fact. And it's really, really, you, you feel like you're doing something that really makes a difference. Yes. Helping young people succeed. They call on you for advice and you develop a relationship. I would always visit with them on their job when they were working so they knew I cared. And I still have a, a relationship with some of my former students. They'll come and say hi and Very visit. Cool. Because, you know, one, you care, and two, you help them do some problem yeah. solving. Yeah. And it, from that standpoint, it's rewarding. It's so you, do you sleep ever? <laughs> I mean, do you... Grant is is such a such a gem, you know. There's only about five or ten cities in the United States where you can go 12 miles away from the capital and be in a rural area. Everything out here is 10 acres. Well, there's a few grandfathered in at two and a half or five. But if you build out here, the codes are you have to have 10 acres or more. I'm fortunate and blessed enough to have 43 acres, beautiful soil, it's flat, no hills. No leaves from oak trees that I have to rake like I came from in Golden Valley. So for me, it's it's heaven, and I just want to really protect right. it. You know, keep Absolutely. it for future generations. natural setting here in the city of Grant to the bustling business community found in the city of Venice Heights. Our next local image segment features the tale of two neighboring businesses with ties to one of the world's tallest and highest profile building projects, the new One World Trade Center in New York. And although Larson Engineering and Dufresne Manufacturing are both working on separate projects that connect them to the site where the Twin Towers once stood, it's their connection to our communities and the pride they take in their workforce that keep these companies rising to the top in their fields. Larson Engineering started uh, back in March of 1979 and we uh, when we first started out, uh, the we was a one of Wayne Larson, who started out as a typical engineers doing their basement. And he uh, started out working with some clients, uh, such as architects and a few contractors, and pretty soon he started to outgrow that. We moved to Vadness Heights in uh, 86. I grew up in sheet metal. I started when I was 12 years old at my dad's company. Through the years he had sold it. Um, I had left the company that my dad had sold to this other individual. Um, I had customers that knew I was leaving and they started giving me purchase orders before I had a, a company. It's like, wait a minute, I don't even have a company now, but we, they'd say we got so much faith in you. We know that you're gonna start a business, so here's some purchase orders. So I brought seven people to the other company, made them class B stockholders so they would have stock in a company. We were there at the old location for three years. We came over here in 1995 in the Venice Heights area, and we've had a, a great relationship with, with the Venice Heights ever since then. We're a, a consulting engineering company. Our main engineering work that we do is uh, structural. We do civil work, and we do mechanical work, and we do electrical work. And within each of these areas, structural and civil especially, we have certain areas of expertise. And in structural, we get into uh, the curtain wall division that uh, we'll talk about. 
and in the civil we get into building roads and bridges that type of thing but we also do a lot of pavement management well, curtain wall is the exterior facade of a high-rise or even a, a low-rise building but uh, the curtain wall consists of uh, glass aluminum panels uh, stone sometimes and it's it's what keeps the weather and the air and the water out of a, of a typical building. For the curtain wall side, we work worldwide. We do projects in Saudi Arabia, we're in, in China, Singapore, uh, Beirut. I mean, we've, we've been through, through many areas around the globe. The blast industry has been a very big niche. We do a lot of work out of this office. They do a lot of uh, specialty glass design, point-supported glass, which is a very uh, unique niche as well. So um, that's one thing I, I is fascinated about this company is we, we do a lot of very specialized and unique things, but we also have a very broad offering as far as the company. What we do, again, is to develop people. We picked a media, I picked a media that I knew very, I knew very well, and that was manufacturing. So it's like building a house where you get the materials, the cement, the wood and all that. You're building a house for existence of your, your family so you can grow a family, a family that has love and support and um, they have a, a household of good faith. That's the same thing here. We've got the business and we have the metal to develop people. We do things that a normal sheet metal company would not do. They put radio, we put radius on parts, uh, hems on parts, do back fold bends that um, you would never even consider um, on a regular brake press and another area is robotic welders that we have that's nothing new but it's all in how you use them and if you allow the people to be creative you'll get creative things out of your parts today we're we're finding work all over the world I don't want it to be on my tombstone that I ship 400 million tons of steel I wanted to say that I helped develop 400 people along with you know the, the rest of the senior leaders here We have both engineers and CAD operators uh, that work for us. And when I first started, we had uh, zero females working for us. Currently, I would say about 40% of our staff is uh, female, which is great. It's great to get that variety uh, in there. The way our office is set up as well, we, you know, we, we mix with the younger engineers. Or, and, and, and so that really gives the opportunity to also train and develop other engineers and also when you're younger engineer to pick up a lot of information from from the older engineer so so uh, really it's the culture the environment and the opportunity so the engineering profession is a uh, I think a fantastic profession but uh, we're going to be short of engineers in the near future I feel and uh, we'd love to have you uh, we also do a lot of drafting and CAD operations here that's a fantastic uh, vocation too. You know one of the signs that I personally have that we're on the right track is that we don't have people leave to frame manufacturing. Um, very 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 few leave. When they open up their toolbox and they say they worked on a model laser and a model press brake and they did all the programming on it that makes them be first in position when they ever would leave to frame. It makes them hard to leave to frame because they don't get this training any other place. So keeping their resumes full keeping their toolbox full is very important to me. Even to a point where they don't realize that these skills need to be developed. They don't realize the skills that I see in them and I want to develop those skills. He's given me the freedom to be creative and you know, build things outside of the boundaries of standard sheet metal fabrication, making extremely new and fresh looks out in the industry that they've never seen before and it's exciting to go out into the public and see things that you were involved with at the very beginning. One World Trade Center uh, was done out of our St. Louis office actually and uh, it started in 09 uh, that we started working on it. Sometime mid-summer the curtain wall portion will be done in that building. From the top of the spire, one of the unique things about it is uh, it's uh, 1,776 feet tall, which is uh, also the year of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the building also sits on top of a transportation hub uh, for the subway system. We're also doing work on that. One of the very interesting parts of Tower 4, which is one of the towers we haven't talked about, 
there's a 50 foot tall facade at the base of the building, steel, five story facade. It, when you get into the space, it'll be 75 feet tall of open space. And it's gonna be an incredible space, I think, once that's completed. We got to the contract to build the uh, elevator stations in the World Trade Center, which was really a, um, a milestone for us. This uh, unit went into the uh, World Trade Center 316 times now. Um, and what it does is that it removes all the buttons from the inside of the elevator. They're not in there anymore. Um, and in an effort to reduce elevator shafts and move people faster, our customer came up with this technology with the electronic part of it, the rest of it is ours. So removal of the buttons on the inside means the buttons have to be on the outside. So what they do is that if, if you want to go to a, an elevator, say floor number seven, it automatically tells you what elevator shaft to go to, and in this case it says elevator number letter C and we make the call letters that go up on top. And this part right here is actually in the World Trade Center um, with all of the names of the people that worked for Dufresne at the time that we fabricated this six months ago. Um, this is behind every monitor on every floor in the World Trade One World Trade Center. It's not open to the public yet, and we were able to go up to the 67th floor and then all the way down into the gallows. And it was just a humbling experience to see the original footings that were there, um, the survivor stairs that were there. It was just a humbling experience to be part of that. We hope we're a good citizen and, and we try to be. We want to leave an impact on uh, the community that we were here and we improved it. Uh, and it's one of the few ways that engineers can do uh, that is by building things. So that's what we enjoy doing and we hope that uh, some of our buildings that you're using now and uh, will be for many, many years to come. We really try really hard to, on these new projects that we're working on, kind of worldwide thing, is to bring in the local suppliers into it. Uh, we have a choice to, to pick them from all over the United States, but uh, we really try hard in research, making sure we have someone in our own backyard. I'm gonna work till I'm 78, I'm 59 years old, so I'm gonna work time 78, change my life at 88, and live to 100, and then I'll check out and go see St. Peter at, at 100. But for the future is just developing those 400 people. I, I think I may be at like a 220, so I've got a, got a ways to go. Two great local companies with missions that make a difference in our communities. Keep up the great work. Now, stay with us because in just a moment we'll take you to a unique school where walking the tightrope is included in the day's lesson plan. But first, an upcoming event that you don't want to miss. It's one big day! So don't miss the 2012 White Bear Township Day Mini Taste Celebration on September 8th, noon to 9 p.m. at Polar Lakes Park! There's fun for everyone, including a great music lineup at the amphitheater, including Monroe Crossing and Rocky Lynn. And here Fiddles on Fire, the Young Fiddlers Association of Minnesota. Kids and parents, bring your fiddle, guitar, or mandolin and join the jam. Arts, crafts, and a Jaws of Life demonstration that will rock your world. Pet animals from the Tamarack Nature Center, take a helicopter ride. And the day won't be done until the featured eye-popping fireworks display takes to the night sky. There's plenty of reasons to not let this celebration pass by. So come out to Polar Lakes Park on Saturday, September 8th, and squeeze some more fun out of your 2012 summer season. Circus Juventus has been entertaining audiences since 1994, but this is no ordinary circus. If you go, and we hope you do, just know it's the kids, not the adults, that steal this show. Oh, 
you're at the Circus Juventus Big Tap, which is a one-of-a-kind structure. There's no other place like this dedicated for kids anywhere. And depending on the hour, you'll see brand new beginning kids, you'll see intermediate kids. Depending on which coaches are free, what hours and what pieces of equipment will determine what's happening any given hour. But all summer long, we're also training for the big summer production showdown. So there's always a lot of advanced um, performers that are working through their choreography, still finalizing tricks and getting ready, and there's always a lot of hustle bustle because we're building the sets and push, putting finishing touches on all the scenes, uh, and they're pretty spectacular. We were thinking we'd donate one night a week to teach kids the art of circus because Betty and I met when we were 16, 15, 16, in the Sarasota Sailor Circus. <laughs> one more time. One more time. Yeah. 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 So we, it, it meant so much to us. It was such a big part of our lives. And we thought, God, wouldn't this be fun to, you know, bring this to the Twin Cities and, you know, show the show the young people in the communities of the Twin Cities what the circus arts were all about. Like I always tell people, it's like a family. It's like. It's like we're all so close around here. We all just hang out all the time. And it's just super fun being around the people, even when we're not doing circus things. Yeah, that and how it, it's the circus. I mean, it's fun. <laughs> it's different. Not a lot of people get the opportunity to do this. What slowly happens by gaining that strength and that coordination is we're really working both sides of the brain, not only with juggling and some of the other hand to eye coordination skills, but when you hang upside down and I tell you to move your left leg and your right arm, you're going to want to move the other one. So all of a sudden everything is different, kind of like looking in a mirror. And the coordination that the kids learn is pretty significant, uh, their agility, their flexibility, um, and then from that comes self-confidence and if we can build self-confidence our young people while we're building strong bodies and hopefully strong minds um, from that self-confidence then you know we're just doing our little part and, and providing something very different and unique for kids to do. Well, we've become the largest. We know we're the largest in the country, probably the world, because most circus schools outside of America are small. We see about 2,000 kids a year. About 900 of them are full-time students that take classes all year long, and, and beginning and intermediate kids do their big production in May. There's nine shows in May. And then the advanced kids do their big production in the summer, late July, August. Uh, there's 20 shows. And uh, it's pretty spectacular Cirque du Soleil style with all of the sets and scenes and storylines and character work. We do a lot of character. The kids study dance, they study acting, character. Besides, um, in fact, we had a review years ago, and the reviewer said, where'd you get all your actors? It's like, they're our kids, they're our students. They, they, their courses are not just circus classes to learn to walk the tightrope or fly on the trapeze. It's a very comprehensive uh, uh, program. scared of drops when I first or like yeah. wrapping up in the silk or the web and just dropping down I was really yeah. scared of those and I I did one and I was like this is really fun it was not even scary at all so it was like overcoming my fear of like being afraid of falling Heights. but being able to trust <laughs> myself to wrap right and We say this every year, but it is true. This show is so different, and it's going to be so fun and exciting for the community to come and see Showdown because it's it's just a rip roaring, you know, old western with bumbling prospectors and uh, and of course some outlaws and Billy the Kid and uh, Johnny Ringo. But uh, we've got Wyatt Earp at the helm. That's the sheriff of Tumbleweed, which is the the set that you see uh, behind us. That's, uh, the sets are going to be incredible. We have a, a Stagecoach that we've built from scratch from parent volunteers that is going to look just like the authentic old stagecoach. We have some other props like our this horse isn't done yet, but uh, uh, he's in the livery and there's a jail and there's the whole Fanny's dance hall and swinging chandeliers and there's lots of work to do still before opening opening day, but it's coming along. You're stopping right here. Direct, direct, direct.
It's an amazing feeling, like working all year on something and finally getting to perform it and having it come together and working so nicely. It's always yeah. just like amazing feeling when it works. P people that are in the performing arts know why it's such a gift and why it's so important to our society, our culture. To, to I mean, it, there's something about performing in front of an audience that is indescribable. Um, and once again, just lots of support from the community. Uh, Parks and Rec has been an incredible partner. The number of parents that we have, the donors that we have, the staff that we have. In spite of the recession the last four years, we've continued to grow and, and, and it speaks volumes for the community that we have and the people that are a part of it. One for you too. There you go. Oh, oops. Apple down. Here you go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, for more information about Circus Juventus showing this month, visit their website at circusjuventus.org. That's all the time we have for today's show. Please join me in September for more great local stories. And as always, I do thank you for watching Local Image, huh? Huh? How pretties. These are big horses. <laughs> You're so pretty. Our heroes from across the upper Midwest are coming home from wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Only now, some have a new battle to fight, unemployment. Hello, I'm Rocky Lynn, co-founder of Tribute to the Troops. I'm Sergeant Dejan Farrell. And I'm Captain Ron Jarvie. A survey of our troops serving overseas found 25% say employment is a major concern for them as they come home. Right now, the unemployment rate for today's veteran is 12%. That's twice the average of others living here in the heartland. These service members learn quickly. They've experienced with advanced technology and demonstrate teamwork, discipline, and leadership under difficult circumstances. This year, Tribute to the Troops, the Armed Forces, and the Upper Midwest Emmy Chapter are asking you to hire our today's veterans. Employers, you've seen what these veterans have done for their country. Think what they can do for your business. To hire today's veteran, visit PositivelyMinnesota.com slash veterans. Heroes come from small towns.